Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program. I'm Wain Rabbani, and this is the third of four episodes devoted to the International Court of Justice hearings on genocide in the Gaza Strip. He hit me first. They made us do it. Don't interrupt our humanitarian efforts. These seem to have been Israel's main lines of defense in responding to the historic case brought against it by the Republic of South Africa before the International Court of Justice. To discuss the Israeli response further, I'm delighted to be joined once again by the world-renowned forensic scholar and best-selling author, Norman Finkelstein. He counts among his numerous publications the highly acclaimed Gaza and Inquest into its martyrdom. Um, before proceeding, several people have noted that only white members of the South African delegation were identified by name yesterday. It would be more accurate to state that only the two members with whom Norman has longstanding personal communications, John Dugard and Von Lowe, were mentioned by name. Nevertheless, and while the members of this delegation are in no need of further recognition, I would, as a sign of respect and appreciation, nevertheless like to take this opportunity to identify each member of the delegation by name. I apologize in advance for any errors in pronunciation and my non-existent Gaelic in particular. Vusi Muzi Madoncella, Cornelius Schultz, Ronald Lamola, Nokuchanya Jale, Findile Baleni, Zane Dangor, Dr. Mashabane, John Dugard, Von Lowe, Max Duplessis, Tembeka Ngukaitobi, Adela Hassim, Bline Nigarle, Sarah Hudifin Jones. Norman Finkelstein, it's a real pleasure to welcome you once again to Connections. Oh, thank you for having me. This might become a regular nightly show. <laughs> if only. If so. Only not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Israel made a number of points. Um, the lawsuit itself is an act of defamation. Um, the Israeli delegation repeatedly attacked uh, South Africa and the South African uh, submission, I think, in quite polemical terms. It accused South Africa of basically engaging in a campaign of delegitimization of Israel and Israel's uh, efforts to, to defend its citizens from harm. Um, and then they made several specific arguments that arose repeatedly in their oral arguments that um, there's a crucial context to what's happening in the Gaza Strip um, and that South Africa entirely neglected uh, that context. And secondly, that if the International Court of Justice does endorse a cessation of hostilities as part of its provisional measures, it will undermine Israel's um, uh, right to keep its citizens uh, from harm. And ultimately, I think it sought to prevent a comprehensive case in the sense that it tried to make the case that there really is no dispute between Israel and South Africa, and therefore the ICJ um, should toss um, uh, should toss the entire case out on grounds of jurisdiction, um, that the facts demonstrate the very opposite of uh, what South Africa is claiming because Israel has gone to extraordinary lengths to provide humanitarian assistance to the civilian population of, uh, of the Gaza Strip, um, that there is absolutely... Um, uh, no evidence of intent, and while statements have been made, um, the Israeli Attorney General is already investigating them and looking into them. And again, as I mentioned, um, that a ceasefire will be uh, used by Hamas uh, to continue attacking Israel and will, and will therefore be to the disadvantage of Israel. Is, is that how you saw the presentation as well, or are there important elements um, introduced by the Israeli delegation in The Hague that I missed? 
Um, yeah, I think that's the basic picture. We would have to go through each point to clarify exactly what was the substance of these bullet points. One thing you left out was, I think, I remember once uh, a few weeks ago, Alan Dershowitz, the Harvard uh, lawyer, among other things, was interviewed by a young fellow from Qatar on a program. And every time the young fellow tried to bring up a piece of evidence, so he cites something from UNICEF, and Alan Dershowitz says they're Hamas, and he cites something from um, another UN agency, and he said Hamas, Human Rights Watch, Hamas, and finally uh, the exasperated interviewer said, Professor Dershowitz, is there anything that's not Hamas? Well, we discovered today's proceedings that South Africa is also Hamas. Yes. Uh, that, uh, apparently a South African, excuse me, a Hamas delegation visited South Africa. And so now there's another item in the Hamas file, and that's South Africa. And I mean... Um... At one point, the Israelis seemed to be suggesting um, uh, the wrong defendant was in the dock, if you will. Um, Israel is being accused of genocide, but it is Israel that is the victim here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let me just, uh, some brief comments, not as systematic as your own. The bulk of the case is clearly ca carried by Malcolm uh, Shaw. Malcolm Shaw. He was given much more time. If you look yesterday, the time was pretty evenly divided uh, between the various presenters in the South African case. Here, the bulk of the time went to Malcolm Shaw. He's an arrogant sack of shit. Uh, I think everybody can agree on that. I for run. Can't I keep can't... his paper straight. Well, that, uh, for the benefit of the listeners, all of his pages got uh, confused. At one point, he tried to make light of it, and he said, I think I was just given a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt, uh, for the sake of the listener, so every few moments he had to pause because he couldn't find the next page. And part of me thought that, not that I'm a religious person, but I felt about it like it was divine intervention. You know how... Hezbollah is carrying on a low-level attack in the north. Uh, the, the maximum is willing to intervene for various factors. And I felt that God was trying to maintain his or her neutrality, but was carrying on a low-level war against the Israeli delegation by con <laughs> constantly <laughs> shuffling Malcolm, Malcolm Shaw's uh, pages. But then I have to say, you realize, Norm, that if that had happened to a speech by Stalin, whoever got the pages mixed up <laughs> would have been shot that night. And I have a feeling the guy who didn't get the pages right is out of a job right now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be sent to the Northern Front, to use an uh, right. analogy. <laughs> I would say that... Uh, if we can use the rough and ready framework that I've, I've put forth, I have nominated, uh, there was the, the, the balance between the law and the facts. I would say in the South, whereas in the South African presentation, it weighed heavily on the facts. In the case of the um, Israeli delegation, I think it weighed heavier on the law. So the two longest presentations by Malcolm Shaw and the other, I guess it was a British judge. He didn't strike me as being particularly Israeli. Uh, the one who went through all of the uh, provisional measures that uh, mm -hmm. South Africa... That was the final had. presentation, I believe? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I think he was... He, or no, the penultimate one. Yeah. Penultimate one. I think he was British also. That was my impression from the accent. I could be mistaken. I would say on the points of law, uh, Malcolm Shaw, he did the points of law, and then he went to the core issue, the one of intent mm -hmm. and genocide. So they gave him 
the bulk of the case. They gave him the heavy, the uh, the heavy lifting, the heavy lifting on the law, and also the factual question of whether this is a genocide. Um, and now I think we should just proceed to discuss how effective we thought the presentations were. Yes, because as I understand it, um, the burden on Israel is simply to prove that there is at least one other explanation for its actions. And if it can persuade um, the court that there is an alternative explanation for its actions, then the charge of genocide doesn't stick. Although at this stage, of course, it only South Africa only has to demonstrate plausibility and the Israelis tried to um, dismiss even um, uh, the assumption of plausibility. And so the question is, were they successful in undermining the South African uh, case? And my view is that so often the Israelis seem to be thinking that they were in an Israeli military court in the West Bank where they didn't have to provide persuasive evidence, where they basically had the judge in their pocket and struck me as extraordinarily careless in putting forward disproven and discredited um, accounts of, of reality in the Gaza Strip that the judges already know is false. Well, I would like to, if we can, um, and maybe it's not your preferred uh, modus operandi, uh, just to go through it pretty systematically. Let's do that. Well, I would begin with Malcolm Shaw, Mm -hmm. His first argument was on a very narrow legal question, whether there is a dispute yes. between South Africa and Israel. And he belittled, now, he belittled uh, the assumption by South Africa that there was. Well, he, uh, he made the claim that the South Africa had not sufficiently engaged with Israel so as to qualify it as a dispute. Mm -hmm. He also said that at the last minute, beginning roughly at the end of October, Israel was responsive to the South African, uh, what are called note verbal, mm -hmm. and that there was a possibility that they could have reached a amicable settlement of the dispute. It was noticeable to me on a, a personal note that he was attacking John Dugard personally. It got very personal at that point uh, and accusing Dugard of basically manufacturing at the last minute a dispute so as to have a pretext for going before the court. On that particular question, I claim complete agnosticism because I have no idea whatsoever what was going on in terms of these uh, notes that were passed between the two parties. Uh, Dugard made a convincing case, and uh, I would say Shaw also made a, con a convincing case because I haven't seen any of the documents. So one is as credible as the other. The only thing I would say is a bottom line on that particular technical question, I find it far-fetched in the extreme that the court will find that there was no dispute, so <laughs> the case dismissed. <laughs> the court will so completely lose credibility no. if that's the grounds it's going to use. Well, especially, I mean, the, the Israeli delegation um, spent much of the afternoon attacking South Africa, only to conclude that actually there's no dispute between us. Exactly. It's a bit of a contradiction. And, exactly. And the idea that they're going to come to some sort of amicable agreement on whether or not it's both committing genocide. Let's meet halfway. <laughs> Excuse me? Let's meet halfway. Yeah. Uh, I don't think even Oprah could have achieved that outcome. Uh, or the, um, uh, what was it, the, uh, the Dalai Lama could have achieved a, a, uh, um, a reconciliation of those two points of view. 
So whoever is right, I think we can agree that's an irrelevance. Mm. Uh, no case is going to be decided on whether or not there's a dispute. We're talking about genocide, so that's not going to fly to say, okay, we decide not to decide this case because there's no dispute. No, a technical, a technical dismissal won't work. Mm. Now, the next thing uh, Malcolm Shaw did was he went to the heart of the factual question, whether or not this there is an intent to commit genocide. And his argument basically went like this, but Maureen, you're going to be my uh, supplement or reality check if I get it wrong. His argument basically went like this. There are only two bodies, professional bodies in the Israeli government who decide how to conduct the war. I guess it's the National Security Council and one other body. Yeah, I don't recall. Probably the cabinet or emergency uh, cabinet. It may have been the. It may have been, but I don't want to say for certain. His argument was, if you look at the orders that were given, the operational orders, all of them said that you have to obey the laws of war, and you can find it on every, uh, every order that was given out. And he also said when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu issued some sort of order, I guess this was like the third week in October, that statement was there as well. So And, and, and also um, the well-known Amalek statement. Yeah, uh, we're going to get to that in a yeah. moment. The, the first part is the claim that all the operational orders said to obey international law. And then when it came to all of those other statements that were made, he said they were made in the heat of the moment and that uh, some of them at least were not quite what was claimed about them. Mm -hmm. And he honed in on the second Amalek statement mm -hmm. that and displayed uh, the, the, the entire statement made. Yes. By yeah. Well, there was an ellipsis, but I suspect the ellipsis was not critical. Mm -hmm. uh, I would take it at, on its face value, what they displayed. So uh, let's begin. I'll first hear you out. What is the answer to each of the operational orders instructed those below to carry on with in, uh, with respect for international humanitarian law. I'm not sure I understand the question. How would you respond to that claim if you were in the South African side? How would you respond to that claim? Well, you know, this was added as a formality, I think would be would be their response. And I, as the South Africans argued yesterday, um, there is such an overwhelming volume of statements that one can't look only at those issued by decision makers, although there are numerous statements by them as well. But you also have to look into whether or not those statements were translated into action by the army in the field. And the South Africans said it clearly was. Shaw today claimed that there was actually no connection between the two and that where soldiers may have appeared to be acting um, uh, in furtherance of these statements, they either hadn't understood those statements properly or were acting in contradiction of those caveats. Do you feel your answer is adequate? In terms of characterizing... In terms uh, of trying to persuade the judges. So the judges have the South African... Excuse me. The judges now have the Israeli response. The Israeli response is... All of our operational orders said respect international humanitarian yes. law. Well, I, I would argue that where you where you have a large volume of statements, you know, wipe them out, destroy them, but then every statement comes with a disclaimer, I suspect it's not very persuasive. My view was that's the job of lawyers. Yeah. And it was probably those... the attorney general who was insisting this be inserted in each of those right. 
That's their job to cover for their, that's why you have a military advocate general in the army yeah. to cover for your officers. So that was one reaction by me. The second one was uh, Shaw said, there are a few little comments here and there. Well, not really, Mr. Shaw. Mm -hmm. You can fill a book with a number of genocidal statements. That and in fact, there is an application at the ICJ filled with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> and number three, even though he seemed to have been allocated all the time in the world, he chose only to focus on one statement. He could have focused on Galan's statement, no food, water, electricity, uh, no. uh, uh, or fuel admitted. What happened to that statement, Mr. Shaw? Well, I think the reason he um, didn't use, didn't try to respond to that statement was because you had another presentation which focused on what was claimed to be Israel's extraordinary efforts to provide food, water, and electricity and other forms of humanitarian assistance. So I think faced with the statement, Shah must have concluded that ignoring it was better than trying to explain it away. I, yeah, I think that he, uh, his main strategy was the fellow on the South African side who quoted all those statements. Uh, his main strategy was to try to trivialize them, mm -hmm. saying that they were just said out of anger, they didn't influence actual operational orders. Um, I'm curious, uh, because this issue has come up in some correspondence I've had, if you knew in advance this was going to be Israel's argument, how would you have preempted it if you were in the South African delegation? Or do you think they already handled it as well as they could have handled it? I think they handled it um, as best they could. Again, you know, this is pretty much like the fine print um, in a contract. Um, and you could make the argument, you know, it's, it's in every such uh, document. No one ever reads it. It's only there uh, so that the person who drew up this contract won't be held uh, liable for all the faults that they know uh, is contained in the goods or services uh, they're providing. I suspect the South Africans felt that by focusing on what was actually said and what was actually done and trying to uh, draw an organic connection between the two, they didn't need to bother with the disclaimers. Mm-hmm. Um, I, of course, I was cogitating over how this would be received by the judges. Mm -hmm. I do think... Just that... to interrupt you, because, because what Shaw kept saying is that the South Africans were giving an only partial account of these statements. Uh... Well, he was saying partial in a double sense. Mm -hmm. Partial in the sense that they omitted the war situation, mm -hmm. that Israel was in a war with Hamas, and Hamas is all of its sinister and dastardly tactics. And also in a double sense, it also they omitted the fact that in the operational orders, it said obey international humanitarian law, I suppose if I were making the South African case, I would have also said, we have the statements. Mm -hmm. We've demonstrated that those statements resonated with the soldiers. They were repeating words like Amalek. Yes. And I would also have said, even in the absence of the statements, we can infer from what's happened in Gaza in the last three months, that Israel was conducting a genocide. How else do you explain the fact that 70% of the victims are women and children? 
There is no other war in the modern world that remotely approximates that proportion that 70% are women and children. There's nothing that even comes close to it. There's nowhere else in the world where the number of children killed comes close to uh, proportion of the population. No, actually, absolutely, uh, per day comes close. So I would say there are two ways to approach it. One is looking for statements of intent, and the other is to infer intent from what's happened. Which is, which is basically what they did yesterday. I think that's correct. I think, yes, in fairness, I have to say that's correct. That was basically Malcolm uh, Shaw's contribution. Uh, and then I would say the two other con the two other contributions that immediately leap to mind are making a factual case. <laughs> the first factual case is. Everything that's happened in Gaza can be explained by Hamas. Yes. As you know, one person tallied and found that, Hamas, that the word Hamas was stated 127 times by the delegation. Somebody had it. Did you see it? No, I didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he was tallying it on, his, on the screen. It was 127 times. So the first half of their factual claim was everything can be explained by the unique evilness of Hamas, which uses human beings, uh, human beings as human shields, which has riddled Gaza with 10 million miles of tunnels. Uh, and Shoots from hospitals and yeah, schools yeah. and all the rest of it. Uses hospitals, mosques, and schools. Uh, and we had those famous photographs, which Israel is very fond of, of a circle showing where the missile is being mm -hmm. fired from and uh, where it's... The going. ICBMs being launched from incubators and all the rest yeah, of it. They mm -hmm. actually did say that. Mm -hmm. They did say they found something. What weapon did they find in the yeah. incubator? I, I don't recall, but they did show they a found picture a Sherman of that. Tank in, yeah. uh, a, from leftover from World War II. They found a Sherman tank in one of the incubators. And so that's one half, the evil of Hamas. And the other half was Israel is doing everything it can to prevent a humanitarian disaster in Gaza. We saw a long line of ambulances which mm -hmm. Israel was sending into uh, Gaza, and we saw us delivering humanitarian aid. Yeah, we saw a that. sack of potatoes, a bag of rice, and 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 this surprised me because, um, you know, they were presenting so much discredited evidence and making so many claims that have been directly contradicted, not only by the Palestinians but by senior UN officials like um, uh, the humani head of humanitarian relief, Martin Griffiths, bearing in mind, as we previously discussed, that the ICJ is an agency of the United Nations. And, and I, th I thought they would be a bit more clever than that, than to um, present evidence that they know is discredited and hoping that it would stick. Well, let's do the first and then the second. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. I know you're supposed to be asking me, but I'm curious your reaction. Um, I've heard, okay, how well do you think the Hamas human shield firing from, rock, uh, firing from hospitals, mosques, and schools, uh, Hamas tunnels, how effective do you think that was as a defense? And related to that, do you think, because I've heard criticism in this regard, do you think that South Africa should have addressed what they knew was going to come, the Hamas, human shields, so on and so forth? So first of all, how effective do you think that was? Well, I, I think it was an argument Israel had to make. Um, and I think 
Israel would have done better by simply repeat, uh, uh, consistently repeating the point and the principle as opposed to giving detailed evidence and photographs and all the rest of it, much of which has already been discredited. I think that's, I think that's where they tripped up. But, you know, um, if, if they were to present this as a principle, I think it would have come across as more credible um, uh, than it did. As far as the second part of your question. Oh, like, uh, do you remember we're dealing with human beings, not yeah. with computers. Do you think if you were to speculate the judges will be aware that it's been discredited? I'd be very surprised if, for example, none of them are familiar with this Washington Post report that looked in detail at the allegations about El Shifa Hospital. Um, you know, when it comes to um, uh, the bombing of uh, an, an Ahli hospital, it's quite possible they don't remember the details and that may be something um that uh that israel will will get away with but you know particularly when it gets to the humanitarian aid um these people also hear you know what senior un officials are saying on a daily basis and with increasing clarity they're holding israel responsible um uh for the absence of uh of uh, humanitarian aid. And so for the Israeli delegation to get up and say, actually, we're giving these people all kinds of aid they weren't getting before, it just boggles the mind that they would make that claim. Now, but to get back to your earlier question, I suppose the South African um, delegation, and given the limited time at its disposal, wanted to focus on making its own arguments and presenting its own case, and where possible anticipating some main lines of um, Israeli defense, rather than spending half their time rebutting um, Israeli points that hadn't necessarily been, you know, that hadn't been made yet. And because Israel didn't provide a written submission, um, perhaps they felt it would have been uh, a poor use of their time. Apparently, they did today uh, make a large written submission. Knowing the Israelis, it's going to be like two volumes. Well, there's a verbatim report of their presentation that was produced by the court. I don't know if if that is um, simply, let's say, a stenographer's version of what was said or whether the Israelis actually... Well, they said they submitted a very I large yeah. document. To, to the judges. Yes, I'm I'm not sure I I'm unclear whether or not those are also public documents. Mm -hmm. I I I it was a striking fact that on the humanitarian aid question they only once cited the World Food Program mm -hmm. and saying that they the officials had worked with them and approved something or other, I can't remember what, but otherwise, for obvious reasons, they scrupulously avoided engaging all of the reports and statements by the UN, the very, the 10,000 UN agencies. For a good reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, to my recollection, so we had Malcolm Shaw, then the woman who came next, and she focused on the evil of Hamas. Then there was the, uh, must have been a fellow who From the Attorney uh, General's office, I believe. Or... Was he the one who did the humanitarian aid? I, th I think it was a woman who focused very much on humanitarian aid and showed the photographs of the trucks. Uh, oh, so she focused on both. I believe it was her. Hamas yeah. evil yeah. and yeah. the humanitarian but, but, but getting back to the broader picture, um, I don't think Israel necessarily had to prove anything today. I think their main um, objective was to poke holes in South Africa's argument, rather than to necessarily present a convincing alternative scenario of their own. Would you agree? 
Yes, they had to. They basically had to do two things. One, deny it's a genocide. And two, demonstrate that if there's a humanitarian disaster, it's not their fault that they're doing their best to alleviate any humanitarian catastrophe, that they have been in contact with the UN, various UN agencies have been trying to coordinate with them. So A, they're not responsible for any of the devastation that's occurred, and B, to the extent that there's a humanitarian crisis, they are doing their best. Mm -hmm. And there were two points that each member of the Israeli delegation uh, kept coming back to. The first is context, that the judges need to understand that none of this would have happened if it wasn't for the Palestinian attacks of October 7th. So I think they very effectively tried to present the case that history began on October 7th. I think the problem for them there is that whatever happened on or before October 7th is in a sense irrelevant in determining what Israel has done since October 7th when it comes to uh, the question of whether or not it committed genocide. Um, the, the second point that the Israelis kept repeating, and this was in arguing against provisional measures, was that if the court endorses a ceasefire, that Hamas um, uh, will be in a position to keep, um, uh, to keep attacking Israel, and that therefore a ceasefire would be undermining Israeli security. And I suspect um, the court will be more sympathetic to that aspect of their argument. Well, that, that um, actually was something new to me or something that I didn't understand, which is you can find that there's a plausible case for genocide, but then there's still the question of what provisional measures will you endorse? Yeah. And I didn't realize there's, of course, I read the list, but it didn't make, I didn't, it didn't register for me. You could find a plausible case for genocide, but then make relatively little recommendations for provisional yeah. measures. And the thing about provisional measures is that they have to prevent irreparable harm to all parties involved in the dispute. And I think Israel's argument was, you know, putting aside the fact that Hamas has been consistently demanding a permanent ceasefire, um, you know, the, the Israelis presented, as you said, the sinister, evil, diabolical Hamas. And if there is a cessation of hostilities, it will basically be a unilateral Israeli ceasefire and Hamas will keep uh, firing rockets at Tel Aviv and attacking border communities and so on. How do you answer that? Well, as I just did, which is there is a party that has been demanding a ceasefire and there is a party that has been rejecting a ceasefire and that's their black on white. Well, <clears throat> let me just be clear on that because I don't know what the last statements by Hamas have been. Uh, will they give up all the hostages just for a ceasefire? No. Um, that what, what Hamas's position is, is that they will not negotiate an exchange of captives unless and until there is a permanent cessation of hostilities. We've now been hearing reports that actually the Qataris and the Egyptians are um, mediating um, uh, a deal, and I'm, I'm sure Hamas is part of these discussions as well, where it would begin with a three-month uh, ceasefire that would see um, several exchanges of captives, a uh, vast increase in humanitarian relief to the Gaza Strip, uh, and so on. But I think the point here is that um, Hamas is not on record as saying they won't respect a ceasefire. Israel hasn't said it won't respect a ceasefire. It has said it rejects a ceasefire. 
And so I'm curious to what extent the judges will be aware of these um, realities, which are not legal or, or technical issues, and to what extent they will have been convinced by the Israeli argument that South Africa is demanding a unilateral ceasefire that will allow Hamas to keep attacking Israel. The possibility is that the court's going to find that there is a plausible case for genocide, but then it's going to enter a thousand caveats. Of course, we're not saying it is genocide. Of course, we have to wait till we get to the merits of the case, which might be uh, after climate change destroys the planet. So we're not making any definitive judgment. We're just saying it's a possibility. But then they're going to say, and therefore we're admonishing Israel to uh, refrain from engaging in any activities which might constitute genocide and not go any step further. Basically call on all parties to respect international yeah. law. Without yeah. Them. Yeah. And that's well, the way they'll extricate themselves from this mess that they've gotten themselves into. It's entirely possible. Um, I just like to um, recall that South Africa yesterday made the argument that it is not only um, Israel and its conduct uh, towards the Palestinians that is on trial, so to speak. It is also the credibility of the court. Yeah. Well, you and, read what Craig Whitney, yeah. is his name Craig Whitney? I don't know. Oh, no, no his name, I'm getting it wrong. The fellow who, okay. His name will come back to me, but he said he was in the court yesterday and today, presumably, and he said it's not Israel on trial. Mm -hmm. He said the Israelis are very, you know, they're very confident. Israelis are always confident because they live in a bubble where they can't do any wrong and they just move the bubble to the heart. He said the ones who are on trial are the is, is the world court, the International Court of Justice. It's the judges that are on trial. And, and I think they, they were, recognize this. He said they were noticeably very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. that they were you know, squirming in their chairs. Apparently, the president had this hot red uh, I, uh, iPad. Uh, it was, he was describing people who, as he said, wish to be anywhere except there at the moment. So... That's where I would introduce the point that there are three factors that are going to determine the outcome of the court's decision or the court's deliberations. The lowest factor we can say for certain, it's the law and the facts. <laughs> That's the lowest tier, okay? The highest tier is going to be the orders each government gets directly, excuse me, the orders each judge gets directly or indirectly from their respective government. Bearing in mind um, that these judges are not necessarily apparatchiks to the very last man and woman. They aren't, but then it would be the degree of firmness with which the, their governments make clear. If you want to have a future, even if, if you even want uh, a, a pension, you better not F up on this one. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, um, we shouldn't pretend that politics is alien to this court. And, and we've seen that in rulings before. Well, so I would, I personally, but you can shuffle the deck a different way. I would put that at the top, the government orders. And the middle is the credibility of the court. Mm -hmm. That they recognize coming in with a, not guilty verdict uh, is going to Destroy significantly it. undermine the credibility of the court, in particular for the uh, four-fifths of the population that doesn't live in the United States, Europe, Australia, or Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, because on top of everything else, the party bringing the claim is solidly third world, as we used to call it. They are South Africa, they are overwhelmingly black, and it could significantly or even more 
undermine the credibility of the court in large parts of the world if they come in with a uh, total exoneration of Israel. Well, let me then put this question to you, Norman. Um, if, as you suggest, um, the judges are going to rule in a way that gives the impression they're taking this seriously without demanding any serious measures of Israel. Do you feel that the Israeli presentation today gave them sufficient grounds to do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you walk in blind, if you walk in blind. Remember, I said yesterday, the um, South Africans were at a serious disadvantage. Because they didn't know, they had not a clue what kind of case Israel is going to make. So now you know what's going to happen. I know the Israelis because I spent much, I've wasted, squandered most of my, uh, my life uh, that was bequeathed to me by the Almighty um, via my parents and the biological miracle of life uh, going through the documents. Now you know very well because. Uh, we're, we've been close friends for a long time. You take the case of the Mahdi Marmara, okay? So Turkey, uh, for those of you who don't know, allow me, because I'm talking as if everybody yeah. knows Mahdi Marmara, and that sounds like a ice cream flavor from Ben & Jerry's. So let me just explain. May 30th, 2010, Israel attacks a humanitarian convoy uh, that's headed for, guess where? Gaza. It always comes back to Gaza. And Israel attacks this humanitarian convoy in the dead of night. And it kills 10 passengers. Of course, you don't need, uh, uh, you don't need a uh, textbook in rocket science to guess that Israel said self-defense. Ten commandos, uh, these commandos land on this humanitarian vessel and they killed 10 passengers, but of course they were the victim. They were acting in self-defense. And they gave detailed stories of being attacked by the passengers <laughs> right. and beaten yeah. to within an inch of their lives. It, it, it broke your heart, the tears <laughs> that flowed from my eyes when I was reading these stories of how they were so brutalized. In any event, why do I bring it up? So afterwards, there's a, a court case. Uh, there were several things. There was, as you know, UN commissions, and then there was a case before the International Criminal Court. So what does Israel do? It submits a two-volume, two-volume uh, statement. One volume was 500 pages. The second volume was 1,000 pages. Okay, and how many people are going to read that? How many people are going to read it? Zero. <laughs> exactly. Well, one, I read it. Um, and then, so what do you think happened now? So you say, <clears throat> what, will the judge, uh, what will the judges think? They're going to get South Africa's 84 pages, and they'll probably get, I'm not exaggerating, they'll probably get 840 pages. From, from Israel. Israel. Yes. Do you think the judges are going to read it? Of course not. They'll weigh it. Okay. Israel has a case, you know. So I cannot be optimistic about what's going to happen. They were saying, uh, look at folder two, look at folder three. You know, and I thought, uh-oh. This is, uh, if you remember back then, it was called the Turco Report for the Mavi Marmara. This is Turco all over again. And it's just going to bamboozle. I should have added, Turkey submitted something also. Or for, the, for your listeners, the humanitarian vessel, it was mostly Turkish uh, humanitarian individuals on the vessel that was attacked by Israel. Turkey just submitted like 30 pages, double spaced. Uh, and Israel 
1,500 pages single space. So uh, I think that's probably, I'm afraid to look because I know I have to read it. Uh, and I'm already thinking how I'm going to get to a printer to print this whole thing out because I'm not wasting my ink um, or paper. Uh, but I think that's what's going to happen. So you feel that Israel gave the court um, sufficient grounds um, to basically not dismiss South Africa's um, application, but not to endorse it. I think and what they're going to do is... Kick the can down the road. I think it's going to be a kind of scolding. Mm -hmm. It's going to be... There is a humanitarian catastrophe going on there now. Nobody disputes that. Israel didn't say, well, there's no hunger. They didn't say No, that. but what Israel did say is that... It's doing uh, everything is, it can. Is that, is that the only grounds at issue here, the only issue in contention is genocide. And unless the court finds that there is a plausible case for genocide, it will have to dismiss. Um, yeah, but I, I think there are different ways to read the word plausible. Mm -hmm. You can, as it were, you can neutralize the sting. You could say South Africa made a plausible case, but so did Israel. But we have to admit it's one possibility. We're not saying it's definitively decided it's a possibility and then they can say on the other hand Israel said it's winding down the military operation Israel said it's withdrawing five brigades Israel said it's cooperating with humanitarian organizations Israel said it's doing everything it can to alleviate the humanitarian horror so therefore We'll say it's a possible genocide, and we'll just remind Israel to please do everything possible to uh, alleviate the humanitarian crisis. So accept South Africa's case, but reject its demands. Yeah. Huh. I think that's, that's um, as the expression has it, splitting the difference. Mm -hmm. They'll accept the, 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 let's be clear, they're going to accept it in very provisional terms. We're not saying it's genocide, we're just no, saying... No, but, but they're endorsing the principle of, a, of an actual full hearing on the allegations made by South Africa. Yeah, but you know as well as I do, Moeen, that's just going to collect dust. Mm -hmm. Once the crisis passes, everybody forgets. Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I you know, um, I share your lack of faith in international institutions. And I think even under the best of circumstances, um, whatever this court does will only damage Israel reputationally and will not have an impact um, on the ground. At the same time, I don't quite agree with you that every judge, so to speak, is going to call their capital and ask how to vote. They don't have to call the capital. Well, they know that I, you know, again, I, these aren't um, uh, diplomats representing their governments in the General Assembly or the Security Council. I think there's a bit more leeway. Um, uh, I, I, I get that, but I, it only goes too far. For, it only goes so far for yes. me. Because yeah. I've read ICJ opinions. Let me here's a here's a a real a, 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 a brain stretcher for you. So there's this International Court of Justice case on the legality of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. whether whether it's legal to use nuclear weapons uh, or the nuclear weapons inherently violate the laws yeah. of war. Okay, can you guess where did the Russian Chinese British, French, and American, where do they decide? Do they decide nuclear not. weapons are illegal? Of course not. Yeah. Of course not. <laughs> doesn't take much. So now let's take the case of the wall that Israel's building in the occupied West Bank, okay? Mm -hmm. There was one judge 
who voted that it wasn't illegal. Can you guess which judge that was? It was the American. And, yeah. and nevertheless, mm -hmm. he endorsed many of the yeah, key... Yeah, that's absolutely true. He went to the furthest limit that he could go with his independence. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But at the end of the day, it was 14 to 1. Yeah. So um, that, that would... Um, and and in that context, you see, I, I, if you allow me to uh, just one thought, because it goes back to something you said uh, a while back ago, when the Al Holly Al Alhi hospital. Uh, hospital incident happened, you said Israel, of course, did it. Mm -hmm. However, the whole purpose of what they're doing now is to sow some doubt mm -hmm. uh, to force an agnostic opinion on what happened. Yes, in other words, they don't have to convince people right. that all they it was a Palestinian is, rocket. All they, is, uh, 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 all they have to do is sow doubt. Yes. And what happened today was Israel presented enough of a case so as to sow doubt on a, on a, a, a harsh version of a guilty verdict, because a harsh version would include all the provisional measures. And judged by that standard, um, regardless of all the criticisms that have been made um, about the Israeli case, uh, it would be judged a successful presentation. Yes, exactly what they did with the Al Ali uh, yeah. uh, hospital. Yeah. Because that's only, they don't want a plausible uh, case of genocide, but I'm positive it's going to be hedged with so many caveats. We are not saying that the state of Israel is guilty of genocide. We, Nor are we pronouncing its innocence at this stage in the process. Yes, but they'll they'll emphasize the caveats. Yeah. This is not. This is just a provisional hearing. And Israel did make a persuasive case. However, South Africa also made a persuasive case. So we really don't know where we stand now. And as you said, we'll split the difference. Yeah. And we'll just scold Israel, not yeah. scold, admonish them. Yeah. In the future, please try to obey the laws of war, which we know you respect anyway, because you're the most moral army in the world. Norman, um, we've already uh, begun part of the discussion that we will continue tomorrow because tomorrow in our final installment of this uh, special series on the ICJ hearing, we will be uh, reviewing the case, giving more of our assessment of what transpired this week and looking uh, forward, which as I said, we've already begun to do Thanks very much. I, I want to just um, make one yeah. last comment. Uh, what we should call this is the Blasi Ford effect. What do I mean by that? When the, um, I guess she was a, just call professor. When this professor accused John Kavanaugh. Yes, uh, the Supreme Court assault, nominee. Yeah, the Supreme Court hearings uh, for what's now Justice Kavanaugh. After she gave her presentation where she accused um, Justice Kavanaugh of having raped her uh, when she was a teenager. Or a college student, I don't read high school or yeah. college student. I mean, high school, I think. Mm. No, it may have been a fraternity, so it could have been, no, I think it was high school. I, who knows? Could be, yeah. yeah. In any event, after she gave her presentation, everyone said, forget Kavanaugh, don't even bother showing up. It's over, done deal. Uh, and now he's ruling on their lives. Excuse me? And now he's ruling on their lives. He came back mm. and he hit a home run. Mm. So whenever, when I heard the South African presentation yesterday, I kept saying to myself, remember Norm Blasey Ford, it's not over. And then today I felt they made enough of a case to sow doubt. We'll discuss that further tomorrow. Norman, thanks very much. And 
we'll speak further on uh, on our final installment tomorrow. Sisyphean labor.